If you can't control your emotions, you can't control your money. In this modern world of index investing and pre-made portfolios, the only difference between a good and a bad investor is how well they can control their emotions. So here's four rules to help you become a better investor and to keep those emotions at bay. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James and this is the place where you can learn everything that you need to know to make better financial decisions. Now, emotions are normally the last thing that we think about when it comes to investing, but that does make sense because it's very hard to imagine the emotions that you might feel until you actually start. But the problem is that most new investors can go into this unprepared and end up in a place of mental turmoil. I recently received this comment from a chap who I know has watched pretty much every single one of my videos and he comments on most of them too. Um, but I got this comment from him a few days ago. James, I finally got around to getting a stocks and shares ISA with Vanguard four days ago with an initial investment of a 500 pound lump sum. And it has reduced by 15 pounds already, 3.2%. I saw yesterday that the stock market was dipping because of US inflation slash money printing. This situation is not likely to stop soon. Should I get out quick before my 500 pounds disappears? Trust me to start investing just as the stock market looks like it's about to crash. I understand the thing about dips and holding on for the long game, but when you invest a lump sum, it is a bit soul destroying to see your money disappear a couple of days later on the way down before you've properly started. And I cannot see this inflation game going away anytime soon. This may sound irrational to you, and it is, but it's very easy for me when I read this to put myself in his shoes. And there's this palpable panic that I'm sure you can relate to where emotions take over you, the right side of your brain takes over and it becomes impossible to think logically. So Birds Aloud, this video is for you and for anybody else that struggles to keep their emotions under control. And you may want to even bookmark this video and come back to this when times start to get tough and the doubts start to creep in. So this is the reality. We are our worst enemies when it comes to investing. And this can have horrific consequences on our performance. Dalbar is a behavioral finance research house and each year they produce a report that shows the difference in performance between individual investors and the performance of the actual funds that they invest in. And in the 20 years between 1998 and 2018, they showed that a typical 60% equity and 40% bond portfolio returned 6.8% per year, or a total return of £273,000 from a £100,000 initial investment. But remember, you would only have actually received that return if you had invested that £100,000 at the start of that 20 years and never sold out. But the reality is that people rarely ever do that. And as it happens, Dalbar showed that the average investor in the funds that they studied only achieved an average annual return of 2.6%, which equates to an underperformance of over £200,000. Why? Well, it's because at the end of the day, we're all just a bunch of big chimps that are ruled by greed and fear that causes us to buy at the top and to sell at the bottom. Now, you may be finding this quite hard to relate to, and that does make sense because Dalbar's research also shows that when there's a bull market, investors' returns actually very closely match the fund's returns in which they invest. And that's because it's very easy to hold on when the markets are going up, as it has been for the last 12 years. Yes, we did have that crash last year, but the markets recovered within only a couple of months, whereas typically bear markets can last years. If you go back to 2000, where after the dot-com crash, the markets slowly bled out for three straight years. That's three years of sitting there watching your life savings slowly dwindle away. That is when people sell. That is when mistakes are made. But it's understandable because that is tough even for the most seasoned of investors. But how do we stop this? How do we keep our emotions at bay? Well, I've got four rules that should help you do just that. Rule number one, have a plan. 
This sounds simple, so simple that most people don't bother doing it, but it becomes very crucial that you have a plan in place, especially when times get tough. The idea is that before you start investing, when you've got your wits about you, you write down very clearly why you want to invest, what you want to achieve, and why you can invest for the long term. So here's an example of that. This is actually a comment that I got on a post that I made a few days ago about how people were feeling about the markets and whether they were thinking about selling out. So sticking to my usual plan, I'm investing for the long term. So I'm seeing this dip as a good time to buy and I won't be selling out for 30-ish years anyway. Currently saving for a house, so have that in premium bonds, but of my long-term savings, I have a direct debit to my Vanguard all cap fund every month and buy a little crypto. Doesn't set me back in the grand scheme of things with my house plan and allows me to start hopefully working towards a longer term. I only invest what I can afford to live without. Sure, if I lost everything, that would be annoying, but my lifestyle wouldn't change. This is super simple and it's clearly written at a moment of clarity. I mean, I'm not sure whether Hannah has actually ever written that down before, but it really does help to do so. I personally find that whenever I'm trying to make a decision or make a plan, I normally look at all the facts and then I reason with myself in my head. And I can normally come to a conclusion pretty quickly. But then I find that over time, I seem to forget why I made that decision. And this normally happens when my mood changes. And suddenly, even though I'm looking at exactly the same facts and figures that I was before, everything looks different. Everything looks different in this different light that is cast by my mood. And suddenly I start to question all of the decisions that I made in the past. And this can go round and round, taking up huge amounts of mental energy. But writing things down can really help you break this loop and give you a window of clarity back to what you were thinking when you actually made that decision. Again, this can be really simple. It could just be a couple of lines that you've written on your finance spreadsheet. But this should include why you are investing or what you want to achieve why you can afford to invest this money for the long term, what you are investing in and why you have decided to invest in that, and how much you're going to invest and when exactly you're going to invest. And it is really important that you stick to this last part and you actually stick to that schedule. Rule number two, embrace volatility. The thing that really gets our emotions going is volatility. Yes, it's fine when the markets are going up, but as soon as they start to take a turn, doubt starts to creep in. And this yo-yoing effect can play havoc with our emotions and it can create a lot of stress. But the best way to overcome this is to make sure that you actually understand what volatility is and why it's actually something that you need. So we all know that as a whole, stocks should produce a higher return than bonds. But why is that? Well, with a bond, you are lending money to somebody else. And in return for that, you will receive a fixed amount over a certain period of time. And you also have a lot of public information and rating agencies that help you work out how reliable this borrower is actually going to be. But even if something does go wrong, then most cases you're actually going to have a claim over their assets. But when you buy a stock, you are not owed anything. You are just buying a ticket to take part in the potential future profits of a company. But there is no guarantee that any of those profits will actually materialize. So clearly with stocks, there is much more uncertainty there. Ultimately, you're taking a lot more risk. Now, as an investor, if you're going to be taking more risks, then of course, you're going to demand a higher return. It's just like when you're betting on horse racing. The returns that you get from betting on the favorite are tiny in comparison with the odds that you would get if you were betting on an outsider, simply because they are less likely to come in. There is more risk involved. But instead of just betting on one horse, we diversify. We invest in hundreds of different companies that are on average more risky, but they're also more likely to produce a higher return. But because we've invested in so many different companies, the chances of them all going bust is practically zero. And with a diversified portfolio of stocks and shares, we can get a higher return than investing in bonds. And there's very little risk of us ever losing money over the long term. But the only trade-off is that we have to put up with more volatility, with more risk in the short term. Term. But let's look at this another way. Let's say you wanted to invest a thousand pounds in the stock market 
and you are prepared to invest for 20 years. And over that 20 year period, we anticipate that we'll get a fairly conservative 5.5% return each year. That would end up giving us a little over £3,000 at the end of the 20 year period. Now we know as stocks and shares investors that this journey between these two points is not going to be smooth. But do we really care what happens between these two points? If we've already said from the outset that we are going to be investing for 20 years and we're investing in a diversified portfolio of index funds, do we really care if there's any volatility between these two points? No, we don't. And really the best thing for us to do would be to just totally ignore anything that happens in between and just let the markets do their thing. But as it happens, this is the actual return that you would have received if you had invested in the S&P 500 in 1999 and stayed invested for 20 years up until 2019. But as you can see, this was an extremely tough period to be an investor. You would have gone through two of the biggest crashes in modern times, and you would have been sitting at a loss for a lot of it. But volatility can only ever hurt you if you sell. And as it happens, this was actually one of the best times that you could have been an investor. Which brings me on to rule number three, embrace the crashes. The last example we looked at involved investing a lump sum at the start of 20 years. But in reality, nobody actually invests like this. Normally, we invest small amounts from our paycheck each month. Now, with that in mind, which of these would you have preferred? Would you have preferred a straight 5.5% annual return? Or would you have preferred to face the ups and downs of reality? Well, you're probably thinking you prefer the straight line because then you wouldn't have to go through all the stress and turmoil of those two back-to-back -back crashes. But let's have a look at the maths for a second. If you had invested a thousand pounds each month for 20 years and received a 5.5% annualized return, you would have ended up with 425 thousand pounds at the end of the 20 year period. But if you had actually chosen to take the real return and instead ridden out those ups and downs and continued to invest a thousand pounds every month, you would have ended up with 557 thousand pounds or a gain of 317 thousand pounds. That's almost 70% more than the straight return. Simply because each month that the markets are down, you are getting to invest that next £1,000 at a lower price and reduce your average purchase price, which is also known as dollar cost averaging. But even if you do find yourself dollar cost averaging into a falling market, you can almost be certain that the markets will come back. And that's because we know that the markets are mean reverting, which means that if the market goes through a number of years of experiencing above average returns, it will, in all likelihood, be followed by a period of below average returns. And then after this period of below average returns, it should revert back towards its mean. So as a long term investor, you actually want the markets to crash. You want them to stay low and to be producing below average returns for as long as possible because they will eventually revert back as they always have done every single time. And when they do, you will end up with a much higher return, but only if you keep on investing. I know it's very hard to will the markets to crash when you've actually already got money invested in them. But it's really important that you try and forget about that money that you have already invested. Because the reality is that for most of you watching this video, you have got a lot more investing ahead of you than you do behind you. So if you're being selfish, you want the markets to crash, even if it involves temporarily taking a hit on money that you've already got invested. Rule number four, act slow. To ensure that the decisions that you're making are not being driven by emotional impulses, you need to put some distance between yourself and the sell button. It sounds like a strange one, but this is actually one of the biggest benefits that come with working with a financial advisor because they actually just put that space between you and the controls and they can think about things objectively and ultimately stop you from becoming your own worst enemy. But you can try and do this yourself just by being more mindful of the mood that you are in when you are making these decisions. Are you having a birds aloud moment or are you in the zone like Hannah? 
just check in with yourself before you make these decisions. You should also try and make it harder to check and access your account simply by deleting your investment app off your phone whenever you're not using it. I mean, I try and do this with Instagram as well because I hate how much time I spend on that thing. So I often delete it. But the thing is, it works. Out of sight really is out of mind.